everyone. I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week we meet here on Zoom to connect, inspire, and create. And with the help of a guest speaker that shares their images, stories of inspiration, and their tips to help you improve your photography skills. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com. And under Happiness Hour, you'll find the links to previous sessions on my YouTube channel. So be sure to take a look, and if you like what you see, please subscribe. Tonight, my guest is Dennis Kelly. Dennis is a Texas-based photographer who primarily focuses on portraiture, wildlife, and sports photography. He is a member of the Professional Photographers of America and the Texas Professional Photographers Association. Dennis brings a lot of experience and his knowledge to his own local camera club, Capture San Antonio, making it a successful and active organization. And in tonight's presentation, One Soul at a Time, a path to capture the essence of a human, Dennis will share his philosophy on capturing a unique storytelling image, images of the homeless. You can see more of his work on his website at denniskellyphoto.com. And I'm very excited to have you here, Dennis. So welcome to the Happiness Hour. Thank you, Linda. Um, um, before I let you, I think we were kind of talking, uh, before I let you go, I want you to kind of stay on screen and fill in what I may have skipped. Um, and then I'm going to kind of just tell people how you got trapped or persuaded to come to this, um, to my group and do a presentation. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't, I'm really bad at months, maybe October we met at Capture San Antonio and um, a mutual friend, Sue Ely, who's in this room, I said, you know, Dennis does these great presentations, you should ask him, so blame Sue. But when I, and presented opportunities, I don't pass them up. And so you got trapped, lassoed, and here you are. So thank you for coming. And I'm excited for you to, to share what you know with the people in this room. Great, thank you, Linda. I'm excited to be here. And it's great seeing so many people from so many different places, even India, that, that's amazing. So <laughs> that's great. I don't think I've ever had a student or, or, a, or a, a participant from overseas that, that's really cool so I'm, I'm happy to be here tonight and join all of y'all so all right you let me kick it off yeah well how did you get started how, you know you've you've got a when I went and stalked your website you have a lot of credentials you you're in a lot of organizations um what gets you really into photography as much I mean you're not more you're not a hobbyist you're doing this you you went all in you know, you're not just posting well, Instagram and, and goofing around. You're real serious about your photography. Right. Well, I heard someone say they were a storm chaser. So my father, um, when I was young, actually before I was born, was a storm chaser up in Oklahoma City. Uh, tornadoes like crazy, you know, up in Oklahoma. So um, he he would chase tornadoes and, and photograph them. And then um, as I was growing up, he was still in the photography. I would, he would always pass down his film cameras. So I would always have the opportunity to to play with a bunch of different cameras that my father owned and his father my grandfather he actually had a dark room so um, spent quite a bit of time you know in the dark room and and then all through college um, back when there I, I don't even know if any dark rooms still exist at, at universities today but um, I just had a passion for it so basically I would go hang out in the dark room people would come in there not wanting to do it and I do it for them because I enjoy doing it so um, uh, so yeah that's that's kind of my my beginnings of photography um always have dabbed in photography here and there you know photographing wildlife uh photographing um people animals landscapes everything you name it just kind of never really picked a genre that i just really just you know had a preference over uh then back about 2010 2011 um i started taking some lighting courses i started photographing people in a studio setting learned a lot about lighting. I was doing a couple of things for Paul Mitchell back in the day and uh, just had a lot of fun with it. Um, I stuck with it. Uh, that's when Capture San Antonio Photography um, was founded in 2011. Uh, the founder since has left and moved to California, but 
um, after she left about a year after finding or founding the group, um, I became one part of the leadership team and eventually took over the group. So I'm all about education. I'm all about helping others. I'm all about learning from others. Um, it's two way. I'm not, the, I don't like to just preach and, and teach. I like to learn as well. And every time I do a presentation, um, I also teach at a university and, and I love teaching because I learn something as well. And, um, that's pretty much how I got started. Um, I, I was a police officer for, uh, gosh, I've been in law enforcement since 1991. Um, I'm older than what I look probably. Um, but I uh, actually retired back in 2016. Uh, the first time I went into photography full time working for a studio uh, doing primarily sports and portrait photography. Um, then I had an opportunity um, about a year ago to go back into law enforcement full time um, as a commander at a police department, essentially the assistant chief. And so uh, the pay and the benefits and the, another second retirement system, I just couldn't pass up, but I still have a passion for photography. I, I, I'm still doing it. I still love it. I still enjoy it. And so that's where I am today. Well, I'm happy that you're here and you're willing to, I mean, you sound stretched. You have a lot of things going on. So <laughs> I'm, I'm really grateful and appreciative that you're willing cool. to give up sure. just a little bit of your time during the week, especially a, a school night. So, all right, with that, I'm gonna let you get started. And um, guys, if you have any questions, be sure to put those in the chat and I'm gonna catch those for Dennis. Awesome. Let me share my screen mm -hmm. and we will rock and roll here. All right. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see my screen here in a second. Yeah, yeah. it's, yeah. It's I can hit <clears throat> you want to go ahead and make that. Um, there, there we you. go. Thank you. All right. So um, y'all know my name. I'm Dennis Kelly. I'm here in San Antonio, Texas, uh, part of Capture San Antonio Photography. Um, I've been a longtime member of TPPA, the Texas Professional Photographer Association, PPA, the Prof Professional Photographers of America. Um, I am a master photographer, a photographic craftsman, and also a certified professional photographer. And I, I say that not to brag, and I'm going to jump ahead here. Um, you've probably seen photographers, maybe some of you are degreed as well, or certified. Um, you probably have seen photographers here and there wearing these lanyards with their little shiny, we, what we call chest candy um, medallions. Um, but it's not really to brag about my accomplishments or my accolades. Um, I always say that that wearing what we call chest candy is my or our willingness to help or for people to look and at, at us and, and get and know that they can come to someone like me for help. Again, I have a passion to teach. Um, I have a passion to help others. Um, I pretty much just told you my story. Uh, I was inspired by my late father who passed away several years ago. Um, but I've been law enforcement for 30 years. Um, my second career was photography. Now I'm kind of on my third career now, going back in law enforcement. But I always feel that, that we as photographers should always have a personal project. Um, we get bored. Um, we get, you know, if you shoot the same thing over and over and over, we can get bored. So I'm a huge believer in personal projects. I will talk and I will hint at that uh, throughout this presentation. Um, but you know, I can't preach enough, uh, you know, this happiness hour is amazing. I know down here at one of our labs, they have a happy hour uh, once a month. Uh, there's photography groups. I heard someone say they were with the, with the group in Plano, which is an, an outstanding group as well. Um, if you're not part of your local guilds, um, I, you know, I, even if you don't join, they always have programs and presentations that may be of your interest. Uh, one thing I always say when I was part of the Professional Photographers of San Antonio is, you know, I'm not a wedding photographer. I've shot, been a second shooter at weddings, but I will, I love going, even if it's a wedding program, because I will learn something, even though I'm not a wedding photographer, I will take something out of a wedding program, whether it be something to do with lighting, whether it be communication or how to talk to people, um, how to listen, um, how to pose, it doesn't matter. So regardless of what genre of photography you enjoy, even if it's shooting landscapes, buildings, architecture, whatever it might be, you can take something away from photography education. There's all types. And with COVID, I know a lot of things went online, but it's really been a blessing for a lot of people because 
It allows us to sit in our living rooms and our offices and our studios and, and learn. So uh, that's pretty much me. And if you have questions at, at any time, um, you know, drop them in the chat box and Linda will, will throw them out there. Um, I'm going to move on here. I just want to kind of go through my journey with my project of photographing the homeless and people in the street. Uh, you know, this presentation is, is, it's how I approach um, just the overall subject. It's how I approach people. It's my method. It's, it's the way I think. It's the way my brain processes this type of things. Um, but, you know, I always have felt that street photography, street portraiture, and there's a difference, and we're going to talk about those, is one of the most powerful genres of photography that we could be engaged in. You know, I've, I've shot many of seniors and many of families. And what do we do? We always go out to the same places. We, you know, we pose people the same way or in a similar fashion. It's just a different face. It's a different body. It's a different family. And over time, you know, that can get boring. And that's why I really encourage you to have a personal project. Um, I don't, I've never shot street work for, for profit. Um, I've had people ask, you know, or suggest I should sell my work. Um, it, it's, it's a project, you know, I've never had interest in doing that, but it, it's kind of my stress relief. And we all need that in our lives, especially in, in some of our, you know, we have kids and, and with COVID and, and family and I get it. Um, but, you know, unlike lighting principles um, and many other facets of photography, you know, there's so many different approaches to storytelling on the street. And everybody's unique. We all have our own story. And we're going to talk about that throughout the presentation. But really, the beauty of street photography is each and every one of you, each and every one of us brings something unique to the table. We all have a different background, just like our subjects that we photograph. They all have a different background. Um, there's not two of us that have the same story. And we all have different ideas, interests, personalities. Some of us are introverts. Some of us are extroverts. Uh, we have different strengths and weaknesses, and that's fine. And, you know, we've all, all probably, you know, a lot of us may be scared of failure. Uh, we lack confidence. Um, but failure is a good thing because we learn from failure. And I can tell you personally, I, um, I mean, I have learned through failure. And, and even an image competition, which I'll just basically, I'll touch on just briefly for about 30 seconds in my presentation. But you have to fail to learn and you have to be thick skinned as a photographer, um, because if you're not thick skinned and you can't take constructive feedback or, or even or, you know, we can't use the word criticism anymore because it's a harsh word. But if we can't take that feedback, um, we're never going to grow as a photographer. You have to set yourself apart. You know, here in San Antonio, we have a there's a Facebook group called San Antonio Photographers, and there's over 5000 members of this one photography group. And I mean, just think about it. that's San Antonio, Texas. Um, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of photographers. And I'm sure where you live, whether it be locally or in your, in your region or even in the state, you know, here we are competing. Um, and I say compete, it's not like compete to be the winner. We compete because so many photographers, their work almost looks the same. Um, so it's very important that your brain separates you from everybody else. And you have to learn how to use your brain. You have to learn your camera. You, a lot of people out there shooting photos, they don't even know how to use our camera. Um, so that will, that will take you a notch up just by learning how to use your equipment. Um, it will, you know, I mean, how many of y'all have gone out somewhere and you see photographers and you can tell they're with a client somewhere and they're doing a session and they don't even know how to properly hold the camera. Um, you know, or you see them lighting or they're not using light. They're not using off camera flash and, you know, the lighting conditions, they should be, I, I mean, I'm a believer in off camera flash at any time. Um, or, you know, maybe there's a lack of confidence, but you have to set yourself apart. You know, we all probably use Photoshop. We use Lightroom to edit our photos and there's all these other filters. Those are just valuable tools, um, but it doesn't help you as a photographer excel. Um, because anybody can go online, anybody can download these photo tools or these filters, but you want to use these tools to add that special touch to your photography. 
and do your images. That's what you need to set yourself apart. Again, 5,000 photographers here in San Antonio, and most of them, I couldn't tell you whose work is who because they all look similar. You want someone to be able to look at your images anywhere from the state and go, oh, that's, that's, that's Linda Nickel. I bet you Linda Nickel took that photo. Or that's Dennis Kelly. I can tell Den that's Dennis Kelly's photo. Or that's, you know, Elizabeth Holman or whoever it may be. You have to develop basically a brand for yourself. You have to develop your style and a brand. So my background in street photography and character portrait work um, comes from my previous career. It comes from people watching. I love people watching. Someone just asked me the other day, have you been to Vegas? I go, oh, I love Vegas. Like, oh, you like to gamble? I said, no, I hate to gamble. I like going and I like just watching people. Probably from my career um, a lot because I watch a lot of people. But where I came from and where I am today and what got me into doing this type of photography, I will tell you here in just a, I'll tell you um, how I got started in street photography and street portraiture. So being a cop for so long, um, I retired in 2016 and I'd been retired for about six months and there was a Mexican restaurant downtown San Antonio that I just loved and I hadn't been there in a long time. And I was like, you know, I'm gonna go down and, and get me some good enchiladas. So I'm waiting across the street and there's a homeless gentleman on the corner and he has his head, his chin down in his chest. And he looks up at me and he, he just kind of had, I, I mean, I, I don't know what it was, but it was a feeling I had never felt in about 20 years. And I literally looked at this gentleman's, the deep wrinkles in his face, his tarnished mustache, his dirty fingernails. And I felt the pain that this gentleman had lived. And being a cop, we don't realize that about five years into uh, the service, the law enforcement service, we start losing empathy. And I never realized until, uh, until this point that I had lost empathy. Um, we deal with homeless people all the time, um, being police officers. And as a cop, I always thought people are homeless because of bad choices they made. They're all dopers. They're all, all druggies. They're all criminals. They've all been in prison. You name it. I had the most negative attitude about homeless people. And that's not a good thing to have, but we don't realize it happens. And when we would have to deal with homeless people, we just, we couldn't wait to get them dropped off, you know, 30 miles away. We'd go drop them off in another patrol district on the other side of San Antonio. We would, um, you know, find a reason to put them in jail. We just wanted to get rid of them. You know, we always thought they were stinky. They were dirty. They were soiled. We didn't want to deal with them. So Going back to this gentleman, I, I felt the pain and it was very powerful to me. And I, I continued on. And when I was sitting there eating, I was asking myself, I wonder what this gentleman's story is. And it was, it's just something very powerful about this, this man. And so after eating, I was hoping he was still going to be there. And sure enough, he was. And I went back across the street. By this time, it's dark. And I kind of uh, fibbed to him. I, I said, hey, sir, I said, I'm a street photographer and I'd never shot anything on the street before but I told him I was a street photographer and I told him I'd love to hear his story and to photograph him and he agreed to of course it was dark so I told him I'd be back down there the next morning and he was waiting for me but I heard his story and I realized that he was not homeless by choice he had lived with his elderly mother um, his elderly mom had uh, got real sick had passed away um, they lived in this little um, shack pretty much on the east side of San Antonio. Um, not long after that, the house caught on fire, burned down. Everything was burned. He had nothing left, no insurance, uh, nothing. And he had no place but, but to live on the street. So, um, you know, he, he claimed he had never been arrested before. He actually had a pacemaker. It was very powerful and touching. So it made me just want to go hear other people's stories and, and and it was just powerful and i literally went out after i photographed him i went and found another homeless gentleman and i that that was what started my passion in street work and street photography and street portraiture so that's how i got to, to doing this type of work so we've all heard the term street photography we've heard street portraiture um what is the difference um so street photography it's very difficult to define because 
it can encompass almost anything. Um, just walking around, taking candid shots, uh, that's street photography, you know. Um, it could mean something slightly different to each and every one of us. But in general terms, street photography is a pictorial study of the human condition that surrounds all of us. And it's not limited to just roadways. We hear the word street and we think, oh, it's got to be someone walking on the street. Um, no, it doesn't have to be. It could be someone standing um, at an entrance to a building. It could be someone standing inside a public building. Uh, there's, there, it, it has so many different, there's so many different ways we can define it. Um, but when we do, a lot of times when we do street photography, and I'm going to get into, you know, being an introvert versus an extrovert here in a minute. But a lot of us feel uncomfortable holding a camera up to our face and taking a photo, especially if we know that they're looking at us or they might turn around and look at us. We don't feel comfortable. That's, that's outside our comfort zone. And that's probably why a lot of people do not engage this type of photography. But I hope that after this presentation, uh, maybe you'll go out and, and, and try it because I'm going to give you some pointers. I'm going to give you some techniques of, of how to help you overcome um, that, that, um, that lack of confidence or, or getting out of your shell or whatever you want to call it. But a lot of times in the street photography world, we may hear the term shooting from the hip. And that literally could be what it means, shooting from the hip. You're holding your camera down next to your hip and you're taking a photograph without looking through the viewfinder. Now this takes practice. Um, some, you know, you're gonna wanna start out shooting wide, um, but also shooting from the hip, it could be from your chest. I know what, I love going to New York City because I mean, that's just like the best place I think in the United States to do street photography. But in New York City, I just get on the subway and I'll just sit across, I'll, I'll scope it out. I may go from car to car until I find someone interesting that I think I can tell a story through a photograph. And as soon as I find that person, they might, it might be someone reading a Bible. Um, it might be re someone reading a magazine or a newspaper. It might be someone crying, something with emotion. I will go sit right across from them. I will hold my camera at my chest nonchalantly with a strap on, and they don't even know it. I might be even looking the other direction, and I'm taking photographs of them. Now, I know I've, I've done presentations similar to this. I've done them in other states. I've done them all across Texas, and I know people, there's some people out there that, you know, they don't, they think that's unethical. They don't think it's morally right. And, you know, I can appreciate their opinion, but we also create history. And a lot of old photos that we look at today, that we look back in history um, are of people that never knew they were being photographed. But today, those, those photographs are so memorable and have so much history to us today. Um, now, street portraiture, you know, what, what, is, what is street portraiture? Um, it can be candid. It can be, you know, it can give you a true look at someone, you know, looking into someone's soul. Um, we all have expression. We all have, um, we all have feelings. And so by photographing someone randomly on the street, we're showing what, that moment was to that person. And we can never recreate that moment. We can never put them in that same exact place with the same exact expression, with the same, whatever it be in the background, we can never recreate it. And that's why I think this type of, of photography work is so powerful because we cannot recreate it. We can go to the park, we can go to the same tree, we can go to the same cabin at the park and photograph just you know different faces, different families. We can do that every day but we can never recreate that with street portrait work or street photography. But, you know, with street portrait work, you know, it takes guts because how many of y'all are comfortable going and taking a photograph of a stranger um, without asking them their permission? Because if you ask them permission, it's really no longer candid. So if you're going to do candid street portrait work, you're doing it without asking permission. I'm, also, I'm often asked, well, don't you need a model release? Um, no, if you're photographing someone in a public place, you do not need a model release. And I, I can touch on model releases at the end if there's time. But candid work can be very fun, um, but it can be very challenging. So um, we will talk more about this as we go through. Now, as 
as I said before, everyone has a unique story. And that's what's inspiring to me. Nobody has a boring story. I've heard so many stories. You know, I thought I had heard it all being a cop. And I've heard so many awesome stories um, being out on the streets. But you have to build trust and you have to build rapport with people on the street if you want to hear and if you want to feel their story. Um, you know, if you're doing candid work, it's one thing. But if you're going to actually go uh, talk to someone and ask permission to photograph them, you have to build that rapport. Because if they don't feel comfortable with you, then they're either going to tell you no, um, they're not going to be open with you, they're not going to tell you their story, and you know, you're, you're not going to be happy with the results um, of your photograph. So this is, this is an image I took. Uh, this was not a candid. Uh, this was a, a I say, semi-posed. So I was downtown San Antonio. This gentleman was actually sitting next to a church. Um, he looked like he was praying. So I thought, wow, this guy is has a really powerful face. I love the, you know, the the stained mustache, his dirty fingernails. Uh, he had, and he just had these eyes that just popped. And I mean, they just really popped out. I just, this, I, I knew that I really wanted to photograph this gentleman and hear his story. So. I approached him. I, I told him that I was a street photographer and that, um, you know, I, I told him, I, I always start by complimenting them. I, you know, I tell them who I am, that I'm a street photographer and I always give them a compliment. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have ever seen that short, that short movie called um, Validation. It's about a 20 minute short film. If you have not watched that, you can watch it on YouTube. It's called Validation. It is the, the, it's an amazing story and it has a photography twist to it. So um, anyway, I wanted to validate this gentleman and I told him I, I, how beautiful his eyes were. And I asked him if I could photograph him. I told him I'd love to hear his story. And he was very willing to, um, to tell me his story. Um, but, you know, as I walked up, he, he appeared to be praying. So I asked him to go back into a praying um, position in which he did. And I captured this image of him and I titled it My Father. Uh, this image actually went to the Grand Imaging Awards uh, several years ago. It was one of the top 10 at the International uh, Photographic Competition. But, you know, I always say if a story is a sentence, then emotions are words. Um, remember visual storytelling. We're photographers, you know. What story are we trying to tell? And I'm going to talk about storytelling and impact and subject matter here in a few minutes. But we are visual storytellers, you know, we tell it, you know, like musicians tell it through music, through sound, through audio, whereas we tell stories visually. And so we have to remember and we have to think about what is the story that we want to tell? Are we trying to show happiness? Are we trying to show sadness? Are we, uh, is it a forced smile? Is it a forced sadness? That's the last thing you want to do is have a forced look with anything. That's, that's portrait photography 101, you know. What's the worst thing we can do to tell a little kid is smile, smile, smile. I've always learned when photographing kids, if you tell a kid, don't smile, don't do it, they're going to give you the biggest natural smile that you can get. So um, just remember visual storytelling and think about you have to plan what the story is that you want to tell. I will preach this. Even being a police officer, safety is always number one. When I go out on the street and I look for, for individuals to photograph, safety is number one. Um, even being a police officer, even if you have a license to carry, um, even if you're a constitutional carry here in Texas or in a state in which you can constitutionally carry, still take someone with you. I, I, I mean that. Um, not only you know, to watch your equipment, but they can watch your back. Um, sometimes there's, there's a lot of the homeless population that have mental health issues. And um, so it, it, we have to be careful when we deal with them. And that's another important reason why we have to build rapport. If I approach a group of homeless individuals because there's someone that really piques my interest, I will try to peel him off of the group and I will reassure him that everything's okay, that I'm not there to hurt him or harm him in any way. And usually they will turn around and tell their, his buddies or her buddies, hey, everything's good. Y'all can move on. I'm good. And then you can go about photographing. Um, I do not photograph anybody when they're in close proximity to groups that I feel that could be unsafe. So again, safety number one, 
Uh, I've seen so many street photographers go down, they set a bag down or set equipment down and they turn to take a photo and 15, 20 seconds later, they turn around and their bag is gone. It doesn't take long for someone to take your stuff and it only takes a second for someone to harm you. So again, safety. It also takes absolute commitment. Um, otherwise, you will not challenge yourself. You have to be committed to want to do this type of work and you have to have the ability to com be completely in the moment. You have to be passionate about this um, and you have to sometimes force yourself to engage with people. I bet if I could poll everybody here right now, I guarantee you the majority of y'all would tell me that you are an introvert um, versus being an extrovert. And so that's okay. Most people statistically are extroverts. That's just human nature. So therefore you may have to force yourself to engage with people. I promise you it's with anything. You practice, you do it. The more you do it, the more comfortable you'll, 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 um, you'll be and the, the more amazing your results will be. You also have to be ready for a lot of people to tell you no. Um, if they tell you no, continue your journey. Don't beg someone because if you beg them, you're not going to be happy with the outcome. And you have to be able to empathize with your subject to build trust. I know I've said several times before, you have to build that rapport and you have to build the trust. You have to listen carefully to them. If you cut them off, if they feel, if you're looking somewhere else, if they feel that you're not listening to them, they're going to shut down. You know, treat them as emotional beings. They're not objects. So some of the psychology with this is you have to change from being an introvert to an extrovert. I know that's very hard. I know they say you can't, I've heard lately, y'all, you shouldn't use the same fake it till you make it, but fake it till you make it. Um, appear to be confident, even if you're not, the confidence will grow. You will build it. You'll get there, I promise. <clears throat> but, you know, think of, put yourself in their shoes. How would you respond if someone walked up to you with a camera and ask permission to photograph you. Most of us would be like, I don't know who you are. I don't know why you want to take my picture. No, no, you're not taking my picture. Do they need to ask permission in a public place? No, but this is where it's important in the approach. You say, you know, hey, sir, hey, ma'am, hey, bro, whatever you want to call them. You know, hey, listen, I'm a street photographer and I am, I'm just digging your mustache, man. You look like you've probably smoked for years. And I love the tarnished look. And I would love to take a photograph of you. You know, you seem like a really cool guy. Just talk to him. Um, you know, don't walk up all stiff and, uh, excuse me, sir. Um, I like your mustache. Could I take a picture of you, please? They're going to turn from you. They're going to tell you no. So just think, put yourself in their shoes and tailor your approach. Um, even kids, a lot of people will, if they will get uncomfortable, and I throw this caution out there. If you're out in public and you're photographing in any direction in which there's children, there are parents that will come unglued. Maybe some of you will. Uh, I know it makes it would make me uncomfortable if I don't know what they're doing. But if there's children around, or maybe the children are the subject of your photo, um, you know, it, you can do it candid. Just be prepared because I have been approached. I have shot candid before of children, and right after I took the photo, the mom turned around and saw me, and she came up to me and got all up on me and she was so mad wanting to know why I was photographing her children uh, she was going to call the cops um, you know she was she was irate was demanding that I delete the photos out of my camera now I will say this if the shot isn't worth it to you delete it in front of them they move on very happy and and the issue's done with um, you know you can try to reason with them you know they may even call the police the police may even approach you at some point but you need to know what your rights are as a photographer. But always remember that when you start showing vulnerabilities, they're going to start showing yours. You know, it's like communication one-on-one. If someone yells at you and you yell back at them, you just escalate the situation. If someone yells at you and you stay calm demeanored, you will calm them down. So just think of this, you know, from the psychological standpoint, you also need to decide what story you want to tell. This is with any genre of photography. You know, whether it be a senior, if we're photographing a senior, what story do we want to tell? Do we just want a senior to stand in front of a tree wearing blue jeans and a t-shirt? I mean, okay, what does it really tell? Or do we want him to put on a letter jacket from football to show that he was on the all state football team? So we want to, you know, base, really emphasize that patch and turn him in direction where that patch is seen on his, on his jacket. Or was it someone in band? Do we want to tell the story that 
you know, they played violin in, in the orchestra or clarinet in the band, um, whatever it is, we have to decide what story we want to tell. And this can be very difficult, um, but you have to choose something that you're deeply connected to and that you're passionate about. But you also have to think, you know, why is the story relevant to other people? Um, you know, what's universal, what's misunderstood about it and how will you humanize it? Um, but you need to tell people that you're, that, that you're photographing why their story is important. And I was just at a funeral the other day and um, the clergy, you know, or the elder that was there, you know, he encouraged everybody to start writing things down about ourselves because when we pass, our story is gone unless we've told someone. And what if they're gone? So write things down. And that's why it's important to tell people, you know, why their story is important as well. Uh, this is an image here. Um, this is actually the only image I took with off-camera flash. Um, this was a, a downtown San Antonio. Uh, this guy actually kind of had this look on his face as I drove by and I said, oh, wow, that guy looks crazy. So I stopped and I talked to him and uh, he was kind of hard to um, have a conversation with, but I finally was um, able to get across to him what I was wanting to do. He kept making fist motions like he wanted to fight me. So I was already on edge. Uh, during this, this shoot, I actually had two assistants with me, so I wasn't overly worried. Um, but I titled it, Really? I'm Not Crazy, because that's all he kept telling me was, I'm not crazy. Um, not, I never implied it to him, but uh, I don't know. Maybe he's been called crazy quite a bit of times. But uh, this was an image I used one off camera. I used a Photo B1, as you can see, uh, camera left. Um, as you can see with the catch lights in the eye here. Now, most of my work that I do on the street, whether it be street photography or street portrait work, um, I do convert to black and white. I do shoot everything in color, um, but I do usually in a conversion process, I will take everything to black and white, or I say black and white, monochrome, black and white, grayscale, whatever you want to call it. Um, I always get someone who wants to try to correct me, but I'll just throw it out there. It's kind of like ISO and ISO. You know, it doesn't matter which way you say it. Someone else is going to tell you that you're wrong. Um, but I do have a handful of ones that I did do in color just because I felt like like the one I showed you previously of, of my father. Uh, I felt that the blue eyes really had some impact and told a story. So that's why I left that one color. I'm going to talk a minute about image titles. This again, this, this applies to any genre of photography. You should be titling every image you take. And that thought process should start at the beginning. A good image title will add so much impact and storytelling to your image. But I caution you, you wanna keep it catchy, you wanna keep it short, and you want it to have a lot of impact. Um, 10 second story, I photographed a police department. I did a composite, really cool. I mean, I spent probably 20 hours on this composite. I photographed their buildings and did all this cool stuff in Photoshop. I made it with the moon. It looked all dark and eerie and the cops were standing looking all mean with their arms crossed. And I called it Bacon Shack because being cops, you know, what people call us pigs. And so actually they don't know the true meaning of pig, but it's actually a good thing. It stands for pride, integrity, and guts, but they always call us pigs like we're farm animals. So I called the image Bacon Shack. And I took it to print competition. And when the call to the um, call taker called out the image, Bacon Shack, none of the jurors understood what it meant. And all they could think about was, I don't know what this image means. I realized quickly it was a horrible title. I knew what it meant, they didn't. But think of images or think of titles, uh, this, this starts at the beginning that will help add impact. Keep an I did notepad or a notebook. I have, a, I have an iPhone and I have a notepad in there and, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a list of names for homeless portraits. Um, I mean, I have, you know, I probably have, I bet you I have over a hundred names for future images and I may start shooting something, think about the image title already, and then go and, and maybe add to it to reflect the subject that I'm photographing. Um, but you can also write other ideas down, you know, at a later time, whether it be locations that you that you see going, oh, wait, that'd be really cool if I came out here when the weather was right and the lighting was right. 
man, I could just see someone walking right in front of that arch and, and catching that moment. So write things down, keep an idea notepad or a notebook, and, um, and you can always come back and reflect on it later. I'm not going to go through these. Uh, those that are part of PPA are probably familiar with the 12 elements of a merit image. Um, <clears throat> my point to this is, is there's three of these that I believe are the most important. And the first one being impact. This is with any image. I don't care if it's, you know, a senior portrait, a, a bridal portrait, a homeless portrait. Impact is number one because it's the sense that one gets upon viewing the image for the first time. If you go show your work to someone, and I encourage you to do so, and they look at it and there's no response, immediate response, your image more than likely lacks impact versus you go show an image to somebody and, and you just like show it to them within a half a second, they're going, oh, wow, oh my gosh. That's what you want. That's when you know that your image has impact. You know, because compelling images will evoke laughter, sadness, anger, pride, wonder, um, or some other intense emotion. And that's what we want in our photography, even if it's a mountain range or a, um, a building or a flower, um, whatever it may be, you want someone to look at that and go, oh, wow, I can, I can feel this guy's pain or gosh, that, that mountain range is beautiful. I'd love to be, you know, at the top of it or whatever it may be. Or that airplane, oh my gosh, that airplane is beautiful. I'd love to be inside that airplane, you know, flying to Hawaii or wherever it be. So impact is number one. You know, this image here, Empty Promises. Uh, this was a veteran of the military. He was actually up in Austin, Texas, off of 290. And, you know, what really stuck out to me about this gentleman was the cross he was wearing. And there was a lot of dodging and burning and post-processing in this image, but you know, I listened to this gentleman's story and he basically was promised many things in life and they were all empty promises and he ended up on the street. So that's where it, it got, it got its title from, you know, and it has impact it, and it contributes to the story. Um, the number, the second thing I think is the most important is storytelling itself. You know, this is the ability for the image to evoke imagination. Uh, one beautiful thing about art is that each viewer might collect his own message or read her own story in an image. And that's fine. Because um, I've had people look at some of my work and go, wow, that guy, you know, I, I bet he looks like he probably did some hard drugs back in the day. Or they might look and go, wow, that guy looks like, you know, he, um, he's been homeless for a long time. There's, you know, that that's good. Um, you know, it can have different stories, but you want it to be able to tell a story or at least in, evoke that imagination of a story. Uh, this gentleman here, um, I titled it Strung Out because he literally was strung out on drugs when I came across him. And, um, you know, I guess my law enforcement background helped me in communicating with them. And I was able to capture this image. Uh, this is pretty much how he was when I uh, he actually had his head down. But when I walked up to him, he lifted his head up and put his hand up on his head. Um, but the title strung out, it adds to the impact. It adds to the storytelling. And so again, it's short and, and it has impact. And subject matter, um, you know, should always be appropriate for the story that's being told in your image. Um, these three things, again, I think are the most important elements. Uh, this is the gentleman I told you about that lost everything. He lost his mother. He lost his home. Um, he lost his means of communication with uh, his limited means, uh, with his limited family that he had. And uh, he lost everything. And so that's why I titled it Lost Everything, because I felt that it, it went along with his story and that it added impact to the image. So what equipment do you need to do street photography, street work? I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but so it doesn't matter if you shoot with the DSLR or if you shoot mirrorless. Now, one thing, if you do shoot with the DSLR, we do know that we hear the shutter. So if you're trying to do some candid work, trying to sit across from someone on the train or the via bus or the, your local transit bus or subway, whatever it may be, that may <clears throat> get someone's attention. Mirrorless. Mirrorless technology now is just incredible. Um, I know a lot of people are converting over the mirrorless. And so I think it's the way of our future. 
lens choice. You know, if you're, um, if you're going to shoot candid stuff from a distance, you may want to shoot with even like a three, 400 millimeter lens. Um, if you are shooting from the hip, you may want to shoot wide angle and you can crop it. And some cameras like the Fuji X100 I shoot, you know, it's got a prime fixed lens on it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Light sources. I've only photographed one homeless individual with off-camera flash. It's heavy, it's bulky, it's something else I gotta carry around. Um, something else has to be charged up. I shoot all of my street photography, or let me say I shoot all my street portraiture with a reflector. I just have a five and one. Um, I usually use the silver um, side to get those spectral highlights, um, especially in the wrinkles on the face. It's easy to carry and um, you can get it in position. You can have an assistant that knows nothing about photography and you can get that reflector in the position you want it. And you can say, hold this and don't move it. And you can, you can take your photographs. Backdrop, street photography, <clears throat> your backdrop can be anything, <clears throat> excuse me. But when it comes to street portrait work, you can find anything to photograph as your backdrop. You can put up next to a building, a concrete wall, whatever it may be. I have found that I wanna focus on their face and their expressions and their emotions. So I actually carry, it's like a four foot by six foot collapsible backdrop. It's got white on one side and black on the other. I've never used the white side. I've always used the black side, but I can just carry that along with my reflector. It folds out. I can set it up against my car, the side of a building next to a bus stop up against a tree. It doesn't matter. And you can get that black backdrop with just a little bit of texture to create a little bit of separation. Uh, light modifiers, um, you know, if you are using off-camera flash, you need to think about a soft box. Um, if you're not, even if you're not, you can use a scrim. So a lot of times I carry a reflector, a scrim, and the collapsible backdrop. Because sometimes I will use a scrim at the, depending on my light. Always make sure you have extra batteries and memory cards. Uh, model releases. I use an app on my phone called easy release. It's, I think it's up to about $10 or 14, 15 bucks. Now I'm not sure how much it was. It was like $3 when I bought it years ago. Um, I do ask for a model release, um, for my portraiture work, my street portrait work, because I do enter those in the competition and that is required, um, to enter into any of the PPA or the state competitions that they do require that you have a model release on file. So I, I will just ask them, I'll tell them what it is. I always tell them I'm, this isn't to win money. If anything, I might win a certificate, but um, I just tell them why I need it. I'm honest with them and ask them if they'll sign it. I've only had one person uh, throughout the years that's refused to sign a model release. If they refuse to sign it, I don't even photograph them. So I do that up front. I don't photograph them and then get the model release at the end. I try to get that model release at the beginning because if they tell me no, I move on. I don't even waste my time with them. Um, so what do I give these individuals in exchange for, you know, telling me their story and giving me their time. Sometimes I'll give them a couple of dollars. Um, I'll give them money. I know sometimes people are like, well, why are you giving them money? Cause they're just going to go buy beer. They're just going to go buy cigarettes. Um, usually when I get money, I ask them, I say, Hey, I'm, you know, <clears throat> can I take a couple of photos in exchange for $5, you know, so you can get some tacos or get something to eat. Or sometimes I may take them what I call a blessing bag. You know, it's, it's basically a paper bag uh, or some type of, a Ziploc bag and, you know, it may have socks in it. It may have, you know, fresh fruit. It may have um, peanut butter and crackers. Um, it could have nail clippers. It could have whatever, but you can also do that if you feel uncomfortable giving people money. Now, on average, I give my subjects about $5. <clears throat> I know it was like the day before image competition one time and I was desperate and I had to bribe someone for about $20 to get their photo, but usually it's about $5 when I give them. Um, camera settings, um, I'm just gonna go through this quickly because I know the time is getting short here, but um, if I'm doing street photography work, I usually shoot in shutter priority mode so I can freeze motion. Um, you know, it's one of the toughest things to do is free, freeze motion, especially when you have subjects walking because you want everybody to look sharp. But I usually start about, you know, one three twentieth of a second, but if it's bright, I may go to about one five hundredth or even down to one one sixtieth in a darker situation. Higher ISO is okay, even in street photography work, and street portrait work, you know, we've all, we've all been told, oh no, you, you always want to shoot at the lowest. Well, yes, you do want to shoot at the lowest ISO, but depending on your light conditions, if you have to bump it up, it's okay. Because I think in this genre of photography, even if you have a little bit of noise or if you're shooting film, if you have a little bit of 
uh, of grain in, in your image, I think it adds to the impact of the image. So that's completely fine. I think it's very acceptable for this type of photography. Um, and it may allow you to get that faster shutter speed that you need. Um, generally, I shoot F8 to F11. If I'm doing street um, photography or street portrait work, I used to shoot um, I used to shoot down at about F5 or, or actually about F4. And um, I would I got beat up in image competition because I, you know, the eyes would be tack sharp, but you know, the ear would be a little soft or whatever. So now I, I shoot everything generally between F8 and F11. You got to be careful with your depth of field. Um, as I said before, earlier, I shoot in color. Um, I don't shoot in black and white. I, I convert it later because maybe I, you know, if you shoot it in black and white and you may come out and go, oh gosh, I wish I would have shot that in color. There's no way to bring back the color. So uh, this is another gentleman, Jesus. Um, I'm actually concerned about Jesus because I haven't seen him in a while, but I, I titled this Lit Up because, um, he, he was from Cuba. He came over to America because he said he wanted to live a, a better life. But this guy, all he did was light up cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. And um, <clears throat> you would almost think he was smoking marijuana, but um, that's why I titled it Lit Up because you would think he was on something, but he was just smoking tobacco and not the funny stuff. Um, kind of wrap up here, some things to ponder is, you know, think in, theme, think in terms of, of themes and projects to help stimulate your creativity. We're all artists. Um, we all want to produce a strong body of work. But we also, in this type of work, you know, we have to, to think about how can we overcome our fear of photographing strangers? Um, you know, even if you turn that hat temporarily from being an introvert to an extrovert, how can we conquer that fear? You know, how can you become invisible and shoot your environment quietly? Um, and where people don't think you're, you're, you know, invading on their space or, or, or that, that you want them to think that you're not even there if, if you're doing street photography work. And, you know, how can you learn how to set up your camera and, and shoot quickly, you know, on the fly? I mean, that's why it's important to know your camera equipment, because you may not, you know, be able to pull your camera up and go, okay, which button, how do I change my aperture? You want to be able to, you want to know what every button, every dial does on your camera. So you can just reach down and make the, the changes as you need to. But I will ask you, and I'll ask each and every one of you is, what will your distinctive personal style um, for your photography be? What will set you apart from everybody else? And this is what we need to think about. And you can't just think of it once and come up with an answer. This is a continuous process because you may develop a brand or a style, and then you might have competition that comes along. And then you have to think, okay, how am I going to set myself apart from them? That's happened you know, in, in my work before. Hesitation has ruined so many shots. I can't tell you how many times I've hesitated on taking a shot on the street. And then afterwards, I'm, I, I'm just beating myself. I'm like, oh my gosh, that would have been an amazing shot that would have told an, an amazing story. Um, but you know, when we do street photography, there's three elements to any scene. It's the lighting, the stage, and the characters. And you, know, you can find the background. You can find you know, whether you're standing on a street corner, you're like, I'm going to wait till someone crosses that crosswalk. Um, then you have to wait, oh, okay, my lighting's bad, that cloud or the sun, whatever it may be, or the street light, uh, whatever it may be, you have to wait for the correct lighting. And then you have to wait for the corresponding characters to enter your scene. It's kind of like casting for a play. You have to wait, you have to, you know, find the, the corresponding characters. But it's very imperative that you pay attention to lighting um, because it's such an important aspect of street photography and street portrait. It can add depth, it can add emotion. Um, so lighting is imperative. You don't have to go out and buy, you don't have to use a speed light. You don't have to use pro photos. You don't have to use any of that. Just buy you a $30 five in one reflector, or you don't need a five in one, just get one that has silver and then get you a scrim and you're set. Again, like I said, there's no right to the privacy in a public place. Um, I do encourage you to enter legitimate image competitions to make your work better and this I don't care, you know, what type of photography you shoot, but there's so many photography competitions out there. Um, they're all over the internet. They're uh, find one that's reputable. Um, find one that you're actually going to get valuable critique and feedback from because there's some of these that that you can just enter anything in and they send you a little ribbon in your email and tell you that you won the image of the day. And you know, find a, a serious competition. 
be open-minded, be thick skin, take the feedback. If you can pay for critiques or, or ask one of the jurors for, for a critique, you know, your ego might take a beating, but your photography is definitely going to, to excel and you're going to rise above the ordinary photographer. Like I said, there's a thousands of photographers out there and you need to stand out. This image here, another day, um, <clears throat> I literally asked this gentleman, I said, so I said, what do you do all day? And he goes, I just wait for another day. Um, he really didn't have a life. He never moves from, I could go down there right now. He's probably on the same bus bench. Um, it was one of my original, one of the first street portrait images I ever did. Don't get a big head. This is like the worst thing we can do. Um, remember, uh, and those from San Antonio that have heard me talk before, have heard me say this a hundred times. We are all students of photography. Learning never ceases. You need to challenge yourself. You need to, to try new things. And that's why I really challenge you to go try to do some street photography, street portrait work. You know, turn into that introvert, even if it's temporary, and, and go out there and, and, and just challenge yourself to do something different. I promise it will, it will reflect in such a positive way in any genre of photography you go out there and do. Um, this pretty much will finish it up here. It's called The Cherry on Top. I took this actually out of a book. Um, but in street photography, how do you know what makes a great photo? And one tip is look for the cherry on top. The cherry on top is a small detail of the photograph, what makes an ordinary photograph extraordinary. For example, in this picture, uh, the photographer here shot, uh, he took a shot of this little girl playing with a toy windmill, and there's a shadow of a pigeon flying away in the background. The reason that he liked this photograph, it's a metaphor for the girl. The girl wants freedom and to fly away. So when you're shooting street photography, you won't always see the cherry on top. Often you discover the cherry on top after you shoot the scene. And when you go home and notice it in the background, yes, there is luck involved in street photography, but when you do get a lucky cherry on top in street photography, be grateful and smile. So my journey on any given day is to go out. Last thing I'll tell you is there's tons of homeless people. I'm sure where you live in your, in your area of the state or country. Um, I know we have a ton here in San Antonio, but I just don't go photograph any homeless person. I actually can drive around for three, four, five, six weeks before I find that one homeless person. Um, individual that I truly want to hear their story and that has a look that I know that they have a, a very impacting and powerful story to tell me versus the homeless person that has the clean fingernails, the cell phone, the clean tennis shoes, um, what, that's just holding up a sign that says home. So um, if you have any questions, this is my contact information. Um, that's my cell phone. Um, feel free to text me or um, call me. I prefer text. Um, um, my email address is on here and my website. I will tell you my website's not always up to date. Um, as busy as I've been lately, I have not been able to touch or put any new work on there. But if anybody's ever down in the San Antonio area and would love to go out or would like to go out and do some street photography or some street portrait work, um, I'd be happy to, to go along, tag along with you, or you tag along with me. I'd be happy to help you set things up, let you shoot it, create some cool stuff. And um, I won't charge you a penny. So um, Linda, that's about all I got. That's a lot. And it was wonderful. So let me get you, if you guys are interested, take a screenshot of his, um, it'll be on the video, but you can take a screenshot if you want it. Um, I'm going to get you to take your presentation down. And I've just got a couple of questions because um, as you went through this, um, the questions that were asked, you, you checked off, check them off. So I think we're in good shape. But um, Mary was curious. She wants to know, do you carry any of your gear in a, what do you carry your gear in? Is a backpack or is it something that, um, so something that you don't have to put on the ground? What, what are you doing? So I carry my, so I shoot still with a DSLR. I, I shoot with a Canon 5D Mark III. I know it's an older camera, but it, it's, it's treating me well. So I just strap it over my um, shoulder. Okay. And then I just carry in my hand, I'll carry a reflector, a, my collapsible backdrop and a scrim. And that's all I carry. I, I don't need anything else. Um, or if I have a well, I always have an assistant with me. It just depends how much I want to abuse them. I'll ask them that, you know, carry my stuff and I'll just carry, I'll hold on my camera, but um, I don't set anything down on the ground at any time. Okay. Um, and when you say assistant, is that a buddy that just gets tricked into, I'll buy you a beer later, or do you actually have somebody that, are you mentoring people at that point? 
Um, I have a lot of people, or I don't say a lot, but um, there, there are several people that are interested in this. And so they're like, hey, can I come tag along? And so, you know, they come along and be an assistant. Um, at times I've had, you know, friends, um, family, um, co-workers, you know, I say, hey, can you come help me? I need to go do this. Or I want to go capture some cool images. And they're like, oh, that sounds cool. You know, and they just volunteer to come along. So um, mm -hmm. I know some street photographers or street portrait um photographers they've actually even put ads on craigslist before you know paying people <clears throat> 20 dollars an hour to go out with them so that's cool um i think your buddy ken is in this room but he wanted to know where did you get the easy setup backdrop so i actually purchased it at um it was um precision camera in austin okay okay and uh, Mary has another question, which I was kind of curious about. She was, I think you mentioned dodging, a little dodging, a little burning, but she wanted to know, do you work in Photoshop or Lightroom? What, what is your, your editing is great. Or may, actually, I said great. She says amazing. But what are you doing? Do you do All both? Right. Well, thank you for the compliment. Um, so I am strictly, I use Photoshop. Um, being that I, the studio I was working in, we were on a server environment. So we could not use Lightroom in a server environment. So I've never really used Lightroom, um, but I use Photoshop. What I would do, I use actually Adobe Bridge as to basically manage my images. And I will use an Adobe Bridge, which opens up Camera Raw. That's where I will do my initial adjustments to my image. I'll, I'll, I'll get my image where I kind of, you know, in a ballpark range. And then I will take it in the Photoshop and in Photoshop is where I will actually do my conversion to uh, black and white. And that's where I start doing all my work. I do use Topaz um, Adjust um, to get some of my grittiness in, in my images. Um, but I basically have created my own recipes. That's created my own style. And so I have my recipes that creates pretty much my baseline. And then I will go in. But there's a lot of dodging and burning. And I will tell you in those images that I showed you, um, easily spent eight, probably eight to 16 hours per image dodging and burning because all those wrinkles I went in and, and burned, zoomed in and with, with a tablet and just went in and just burned them with a small brush. And, and so it takes a lot of time. Okay. Yeah. Um, there was a, a, and John, you're, you're not the only one I'm going to make him. What is a scrim so that we're all on the same page? So a scrim is basically a translucent panel. Um, a lot of times like a five in one reflector, um, if you unzip the outer cover and you pull out the inside, it basically is a kind of a, a frosted looking panel. And so you can use that. So if you say the sun pops out from behind a cloud, you can actually hold that up and reduce um, the light by, you know, depending on the scrim, you can reduce it from a stop, a full stop, to some of them are even two stops worth of light. Okay. So it, it also give you a softer light um on whatever side it is um and then i'll use my so it kind of contradicts itself but i'll use the the silver reflector you know for the the side i'm really wanting to show the impact on so you want to have that light ratio so it's not flat lit you you do want to create a, a a ratio um where you know one side of the face is is darker than the other so i know you covered this and it was um you know take a buddy don't go alone but there are quite a few women that are interested in street photography um, somebody in the chat said, you know, maybe approach homeless women, but I'm curious if you have, can offer a couple of tips for, for women other than. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, that's, that's a great question. Um, as I said, safety number one. So I'm glad the question was asked. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I tell you that most harmless, most homeless individuals out there are harmless. Um, if you're going to go out there, stay in a populated area, you know, near like gas station somewhere, you know, should you, you need help. Um, now, not, I don't want to sound sexist here, but I, I would suggest, you know, if you do have a male, you know, friend or spouse or whatever it may be that you could go with something about the, the, just the perception of a male, you know, if, if it's a male homeless person, they, you know, they may look at a woman as being more vulnerable versus a man. Um, so I would definitely suggest maybe start out until you build some confidence up. But I, I know people, I know females that do this type of work and they go with another female all the time, every day. Um, 
and so the best times to do any type of this um, street photography or street portrait work is you generally either early morning or in the evening before uh, sundown. Uh, obviously, that's when our lighting is best. And that's usually when there's more, the most people out and about anyway. So that does kind of help because if you're by a gas station, that's when people are filling up their cars on the way to work, you know, coming home from work, stopping in, you don't have to work, getting a beer, whatever it may be. So um, just take it easy. Um, you know, if you do, I don't, you know, being a cop, I always carry a gun with me everywhere I go because I have to. But, you know, if you have a license to carry or if you have constitutional carry, you know, I would, I would definitely recommend just for peace of mind that you might, you know, go ahead and, and carry a firearm. I know my son, my 15 year old, you know, when we go, he goes with me sometimes and he carries his knife. <laughs> you know, that's his, uh, his dad. I'm going to be ready for him. You know, if it goes down, I'm like, okay, son, you know, but um, I wouldn't, I would hopefully never intentionally, I would never intentionally put my son in, in a position. I know I've been People beat up on me before going, oh my gosh, you took your 15 year old son with you. Oh my gosh, what if some, what if one of these homeless people, you know, does this or does that? And, you know, you just have to fill out the, 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 your surroundings. You can't be, you can't have tunnel vision. If you see that, that person and you're like, oh my gosh, that would be an amazing lady to photograph or an amazing man to photograph. And they may not even be homeless. It may just be someone sitting on the bus bench, you know, that, you know, that just has a really cool look to them, you know, wearing a, cowboy hat with a mustache with handlebars and you're like oh wow that guy looks cool um you, you know don't be so focused that you forget about your surroundings you know always check your surroundings um you know i, I even if you got to go around the block a couple times to make sure that you know you don't see a, a some gang members you know walking from a block away you know before you decide you're going to make the approach so i I don't know there's really a, a set good answer for that. Um, I think as time goes, um, you'll become more confident. And I don't want to use the word comfortable because if we get comfortable, that's when we get hurt. So mm -hmm. I would say you'll become more confident, but always be around your surroundings. You know, like we say in the police world, you know, keep your head on a swivel. And that's why it's good to have an assistant next to you because, you know, when you're focused on the subject, they can be checking your surroundings 360 degrees. Yeah. Um, so there's one, it's not a, well, I guess it is a question. Um, you shared your email address and the, there was a, an inquiry in the chat. She's wondering if you would be open to um, maybe talking to her about one of her shots kind of offline sometime. And you can say no and we can all go, okay, we won't ask her that. But um, I'm hoping you won't say no. Will you, will you help us? Help Absolutely. I, I will tell you this. I say we're all students of photography and I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for people looking at my images and critiquing yeah. them and, and providing feedback. You know, photography is very subjective. Yep. It's like my post-processing, you know, um, someone said, oh, you know, my post-processing work was awesome. I've had jurors say, well, I think it's overcooked. It's overdone. And then they'll argue, you know, and another just says, no, I think it fits the subject. I think it adds to the impact. And then you, you may have another juror says, well, I think he could have done more. It's all subjective. But um, yes, I, I, for no charge, um, I, I love to help and teach. So email me. Um, I'd be happy to, to look at your image and, and give you feedback. All I ask is that, you know, you're open to feedback um, because I've had people ask me for feedback before. I'm not going to be mean, you know, but I've had people, you know, ask for feedback and I give them, you know, constructive feedback and then they get their feelings hurt because, you know, for whatever reason, and then <laughs> we're done. Well, you and I are going to talk um, because I'm. You're. This is not your your only um, presentation. So just say yes, Linda. I'd love to come back because um, I have a great idea. So just say yes, awesome. Linda. I'd love to come back. Go ahead. Yes, Linda. It. I'd love to come back. Did everybody hear it? Okay, because I'm thinking just off the top of my head because. I'm always thinking of how I can make people do things. Um, maybe we can get you to come and do a kind of a blind critique where people will submit some images sure. and I can get them to you ahead of time and that'll give you some time to talk about them or select them. And then maybe we can kind of come back and do just a presentation in general on some, some images. And if you're okay with that, I'll work I'd love that. To. I love doing image critiques. I've judged at state competitions and, and so I love providing that feedback because without feedback, like I said earlier, we, we kind of just were stagnant and we, and we need feedback to become better photographers. And I mean, even if we've been doing this for 40 years, 50 years, yeah. you know, we, we can all 
become better. And that's yeah. with anything that we do in life. So well, I'd be happy to. Yay. Okay. So we will work that out. Great. Dennis, thank you so much. I, I bet you didn't think, you know, hey, you know, I'd get trapped in, in a room with Linda and you'd be here on a Wednesday night. But I really appreciate you doing that. It was nice to meet you in San Antonio. And, and I hope that our, our paths cross again. Um, I'm going to close out the session tonight. So if you guys want to connect with Dennis, you can connect with him through his website at Dennis Kelly photo.com. That's Dennis Kelly, K-E-L-L-E-Y, photo.com. I will um, include the links uh, down in the um, show notes when, when, when this goes on YouTube. And then next week, Kentucky documentary uh, photographer Malcolm Wilson will be here to present cultural photojournalism. What is it and why is it important? And until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.